there are two, two kinds of startups. The ones that achieve some modest traction on top of a pile of code in which they are vaguely ashamed, and the ones that go out of business. And uh, my company, I mean, the reason why I'm here, my company did get some, some traction um, as a startup. And yeah, we're, we've got a pile of code that we're uh, vaguely uh, ashamed of. And, uh, and we, ha we got you know, a, a lot of traction, and, and we're successful. But uh, yeah. So the, I want to cover, uh, in this talk, I want to talk about legacy software and the, the legacy problem. Um, and then I want to do two case studies. One where we uh, extracted a service from our, uh, our PHP monolith, uh, and then a, a case study of a drop and replacement for an external, uh, external service. Um, so, you know, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them what you told them. <laughs> this is, uh, if you take nothing else away from this talk, uh, legacy code is uh, fossilized technical debt. Uh, when doing this, we want to iterate and learn uh, in production, and uh, we can modernize w into Scala with uh, modernization patterns. So uh, who am I? I'm a senior engineer at a company called uh, Hootsuite. Uh, I've got uh, an embarrassing number of years of, of Java experience. Uh, my, my background is in uh, enterprise uh, software modernization. Yes. COBOL and Fortran and RPG to obnoxious and embarrassing um, Java enterprise. So uh, basically legacy to legacy, like instant legacy except Java. Uh, but now here I am in Scala and with new problems, uh, interesting problems, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm never looking back to that kind of enterprise-y uh, stuff before. But I'm able to apply what I learned in, uh, in you know, COBOL and Fortran land to PHP land. Uh, so what's Hootsuite? Uh, it's the world's most widely used social relationship platform. Uh, we can aggregate uh, social media uh, accounts, and uh, we have uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of users, and we have a lot of uh, enterprise users. And we were founded about six years ago, and we got that modest traction. We got uh, a lot of traction, actually. A very successful startup, and uh, we did it because of, uh, 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 because of PHP, but now we're kind of running into problems. This slide is just kind of shows the, the, hockey, the standard stock hockey stick graph uh, about, about Hootsuite. The, the point here is that we had uh, user growth and acquisitions and all sorts of different requirements, all sorts of different things happening over the last, uh, the last six years. This is a screenshot of our dashboard. Uh, this is one of the one of the kind of the features of our uh, of our product. You can kind of aggregate dif different social media accounts and uh, display them in uh, in streams. So, the problem with legacy legacy code is fossilized technical debt. What does this mean? Uh, technical debt that is so pre prevalent that it becomes the thing that, that blocks your, your progress. Maintenance costs skyrocket. Fixing bugs, fixing security problems. If, if you are struggling with technical debt, uh, then, this, then this, the cost of maintenance explodes. Hosting your, your monolith uh, it, it explodes. Deploying it, getting it up to the hosting, uh, becomes non-trivial. Scaling it, of course, uh, meeting the demands, meeting the scaling demands of your, uh, of, of your growth. And that leads to fragility uh, in, in everything and, and, and just risk. And risk in doing anything, risk in, in uh, whatever, whatever you try to do. Risk leads to FUD across the organization. And then we're into innovation paralysis because we can't, we can't do anything in our, in our legacy, our fossilized legacy uh, monolith. And so the thing, as a technologist, the thing that makes me really sad uh, about this is that the technology itself becomes the bottleneck. So your, your organization is, 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 uh, is successful and Instead of you know, the sales funnel or the marketing or, or anything like this, it's the technology. The technology should never be the, the bottleneck to innovation, to meeting customers' demands. That should, that's the easy part, writing code. and it, it should be the easy part. But when we're in fossilized technical debt, the, the technology itself uh, is the bottleneck. 
So what's our specific legacy problem? Well, it's our, our, our big, huge PHP monolith. Do uh, you know, everyone kind of familiar with monolith? One repository, massive amount of, of code, not really uh, uh, difficult to, uh, to collaborate on. PHP is dynamically typed. That plus a large code base, plus uh, lack of modularity and low test coverage uh, just leads to, leads to um, just difficulties in, in doing anything uh, that, that you want to accomplish. Yeah, so I, I wanted to kind of digress here and, and, think, and talk about, about PHP. Like, why, why PHP? Everyone's, you know, uh, everyone always makes, makes fun of me for like slagging on PHP. Um, but I want to kind of back up and talk about well, why, why PHP? Why does PHP run like 80% of the, the world's websites or, or, or something? And uh, like, it, our company would not have existed without PHP, without the kind of the rapid iteration, the rapid uh, kind of uh, um, kind of fail fast attitude of uh, something that is you know dynamically typed and, and can can spin out into production uh, really quickly. And why why was it so easy to do that six years ago? Why was everyone in the world doing uh, doing PHP uh, uh, six to ten years ago? It's because of the PHP community. PHP answered the question, how do you write a dynamic web page and, and produce that in, in information on the internet? It was the go-to answer to that question. Everybody did it because it was incredibly low barrier of entry and that was because of the, the PHP uh, community. And so everybody uses PHP and it was, it, it was great. It served us at Hootsuite really, really well. We scaled it as much as we could uh, to you know, 10 and 11 million users. And I think it would be really interesting if, uh, and good for all of us, if Scala became the answer to today's question of scalability and, uh, and concurrency and uh, appropriate use of cloud resources or minimizing uh, use of cloud resources. Wouldn't it be great if that answer, that the pervasive answer to those questions uh, was Scala? Just like the answer to how do I make a dynamic web page, uh, the answer to that question was, uh, was PHP. Wouldn't it be great if Scala was the answer, the pervasive answer? Wouldn't it be great if the, uh, the bar to entry of Scala was so low that it was as pervasive as PHP is today, five years from now? Community. I think the answer, the answer to that and how we can kind of encourage that is, is community. That's just a little bit of a digression. So <laughs> there it is. Uh, so that's, that's the monolith. Uh, each, one of these, uh, each one of these little PHP icons uh, represents an AWS instance. I put them in a rectangle to make it a, a, a monolith. Um, yeah, I think there's 60 AWS instances. That's how we uh, uh, horizontally scale. It kind of looks like this. It connects to like this huge, uh, <laughs> this, this uh, f a fat database. And, and then, oh yeah, and there's some other stuff in there. There's a caching layer, and there's some Redis, and there's some, uh, <laughs> some Mongo I'll kind of, kind of throw in, but that, that's, that's basically it. Um, and so we had to, we want to crawl out of the, uh, the, the legacy hole and the fossilized technical debt hole. And wh why, why else do we need to do that besides the kind of the obvious things around uh, innovation? Well, uh, future product integ integration needs. Uh, as we offer s uh, more disparate products, we need to uh, we need to integrate integrate them with each other and integrate them with the uh, with the monolith and and the data. Uh, a you know platform as a service offerings, API offerings. Uh, Companies that we acquire will need to uh, start reading and, and being uh, uh, and integrating with our with our user base and, and different information. It would be very difficult to, uh, uh, or rather, politically disastrous to force all of these uh, all of these acquisitions to <laughs> start learning PHP and you know rewrite their you know beautiful Python code to PHP. How do we how do we address that? Well, uh, we we modernize. Uh, the cost of horizontally scaling PHP is, uh, is uh, out of hand. Here's a quote from our VP saying, uh, the only way that we can horizontally scale this is uh, you know, spinning up, just throwing more money at, at Amazon. Uh, just uh, more and more AWS instances. That's the only thing that, that we can do. Just more money to Amazon to horizontally scale. Scalable. 
And so the, uh, the motivation is to use composable microservices and to go towards a service-oriented architecture. Uh, an in, uh, a uh, requirement of this effort is integration with the monolith. And another important requirement is uh, fault tolerance, uh, specifically uh, partial outages. You know when you're uh, browsing through Amazon and you select, your, select a movie or whatever that you stopped the, the previous night because you were too tired to finish, and instead of starting where you, where you left off, it goes to the, back to the beginning of your movie, and, you, and it's like, what's, what is this? That's a, that's, an Amazon, or that's, a, that's, a Netflix, that's a Netflix partial outage. The service that supplies your bookmarks for whatever you're doing is, is down, um, but it's a partial outage and you can still browse Netflix because of their ability to, to deal with that partial outage. The default behavior is just right, go right back to the beginning of your, uh, of your show and continue. So that's, that's important. And that's an important factor of, of SOA and our, uh, a requirement for our, uh, for our, uh, our effort. Oh, and one more thing. Zero downtime. We're replacing the, you know, whatever metaphor you want to use. We're replacing the wings on the airplane uh, at, while it's at 30,000 30, feet and it's full of passengers. Or, you know, pick your own <laughs> metaphor there. The wheels on the truck is a good one, too. Uh, but we have to do it with zero downtime. It's, it's, our SLAs indicate that we can't go down. Our, our, our service, uh, our offering cannot go down at, at any time. So how do we do this in our engineering team? Uh, Iterative experiments leading to commitment. I'm talking about kind of, well, why, this is the why Scala question. Well, we didn't, you know, there was no kind of, you know, white paper on it. We just tried it. We uh, did a couple of experiments, a couple of isolated but high throughput services, uh, implemented them Scala, and they worked, uh, worked really well. Uh, we built them. We measured how, the, how, uh, how we built them. We measured how successful we are. We learned from that and then just iterated uh, around and led to our, our conclusions. And the most important thing is always in production. There was no kind of FACO, uh, FACO environments or halfway there or virtualizations. No, it was everything in production uh, all the time, right from the very beginning. That's, that's, where we, that's where you learn. You learn in production. So what was our decision? Uh, Scala and ACA, obviously. Uh, and our, our requirements and our decision were kind of very well, and, and very well aligned with the, uh, the uh, reactive manifesto, so responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. We, we all know all about that and, and why. Um, we decided to go down two paths. Uh, the, uh, one was roll our own uh, microservices framework, and I'll talk about that later, and the other one was to use Play Framework. So microservices framework for uh, integrating with PHP and each other in our microservices architecture, and then for kind of uh, externally facing HTTP stuff, we went with a play framework. So it was mostly, uh, m mostly our framework and then the occasional play, uh, play um, application thrown in. So uh, how do you take a bunch of PHP developers while you're going through a massive hockey stick growth and expanding engineering by you know, four times in, in two years? How do you, uh, how do you scale the, the engineering team? Uh, into, into Scala, away from PHP and into Scala. Well, we hired Java developers, like, uh, like everyone. We partnered with uh, the uh, rad guys at Bold Radius to do uh, training sessions and to, to train uh, Java developers with incredible success. Plus, kind of gradual integration to the kind of the, the software culture that we've, uh, that we've established. Um, we needed to scale the development practice itself, though, to get, into, uh, to get into SOA. And so for that, we turn to Conway's Law. So Conway's Law says that your, uh, your functional, that, that the, the software that you produce is going to be aligned on how your teams are organized and how they communicate. So here, siloed functional teams lead to silo application architectures. And you can see the, the, there's a front end, the database, and here's the monolith. Because your UI guys and your middleware guys and your DBAs are all separate. Conversely, uh, if you have cross-functional teams divided around kind of uh, service boundaries, you will make a service-oriented uh, architecture by simply organizing your human beings. Um, this is from uh, uh, Martin Fowler and James Lewis microservices uh, article, which is amazing if you care about SOA. 
So this is what we did at, at Hootsuite. We, uh, we aligned the team. This is, all this says is uh, we have a bunch of uh, products that will, uh, that will uh, consume and produce services. Some are user facing, some are, uh, some are not. And these are how we kind of reorganized our teams. And each of these teams actually have PHP developers and front end developers and Scala developers. And, uh, and that's how we're going forward. So, okay, so that's kind of like a, like a, like a background. And so now this is the first of, uh, first of the two, two case studies. This is the member service extraction from, from the monolith. We call our, uh, our users uh, members. Um, and so member service is the, our kind of just user, uh, user uh, um, information. I think I have a slide on that. Um, so basically we're going from this, the, the monolith attaching to uh, a MySQL uh, database, to this. So uh, a, a service with uh, another database that encapsulates that database and exposes uh, information about, about members, which are users. So what, what did we start with and what were our kind of requirements? So the uh, so storage, lookup, and credential validation of all of our users, all 11 million of our users. We started with pervasive embedded uh, SQL everywhere in the everywhere in the PHP, PHP. So wherever you needed something about a, a, a user, you would just like write some SQL to select such and such from from whatever. Yeah, there was a caching layer, but it was just uh, it was messy. Uh, we the the box that we drew around the service, the functionality of the service was a database schema change. So kind of a subset of the table we wanted to kind of put in the service and while uh, leaving the rest uh, the rest behind. And then four thousand requests a second. Uh, and zero downtime. So how do we take a, a bunch of this, uh, a bunch of this PHP code, which is completely per, uh, pervasive, and uh, extract it into a service with zero downtime while maintaining 4,000 requests a second, like something like 5,000 at peak. To back up, uh, why, why member service? Like, why did we draw the box around the, uh, this service? Well, uh, we follow the dependencies. So the, uh, the dependencies in the PHP, everything kind of like depended on, on users, of course, because you know you need a user to do anything, to any activity. Um, and so we kind of went analyzing the PHP and deciding what to do first and what other services would need, both inside and, and outside of the, the monolith, we ended up with the box around this uh, around member service. We also wanted to start with the hardest thing because we're crazy. Uh, we wanted to prove out our technology. We wanted to uh, uh, the the microservices architecture that we did or that, that we designed. We wanted to make sure that it was going to be something that we could uh, that we could actually use. And so uh, because yeah uh, because we were optimistic and a little bit insane, we started with the absolute hardest thing that we could uh, that we can think of. Not some like esoteric feature or an esoteric uh, 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 record. We started with like the users the the logged in users. And then also business drivers. So this is where our acquisitions uh, come in. We need to, uh, we need to, to, to extract this specific service for, uh, to integrate our, our acquisitions so that they could, we can kind of pull them into our fold and then expose their, uh, expose their you know, whatever they're doing as another uh, Hootsuite product. How uh, we did it. Well, we created the Scala service. Uh, we created our, our, uh, our microservices uh, framework. We refactored the PHP to use a central internal API for calls. And this was the hardest part, actually. I don't know if anyone has ever uh, done a major, massive refactoring of a dynamic uh, language, but the step before this was write unit test coverage over, <laughs> over the, entire, uh, the entire code base. All the code base, that, all the code that we were touching had to now have unit test coverage, didn't before of course, uh, so that we could safely, uh, uh, safely uh, uh, refactor it to use an internal API call. Then we created a PHP SDK for calling the new service. So this SDK would do the, would wrap the, uh, the like kind of the RPC layer. Uh, and uh, then we dark launched it. What's dark launching? It's awesome. It's uh, just a, our kind of cool name for, uh, for feature flagging. And I'm gonna digress uh, into this because this is a really important and, and essential uh, factor in how we did this. So uh, dark launch is feature, uh, like I said, feature flagging. It's instantaneous across an entire cluster, all of our, our 60 nodes, instantaneous feature flagging. 
Uh, we use console as a distributed key value store. And uh, actually, uh, I was talking to the TypeSafe guys today. And uh, Conductor is actually going to have some overlap in, in this department, apparently. So we're going to look really hard at that. And that sounds super cool. Um, it comes in many flavors. So instead of just like kind of Boolean, uh, Boolean flagging, uh, we can do a percentage of random users. So 20% of incoming users will get this, this feature on. We can do a percentage of static users. So it'll be, you know, your user ID mod, uh, you know, mod 30% or whatever, and you'll always get that new feature. Um, we could do a, a Hootsuite organization. So one of our enterprise customers that has an organization, we can turn on a feature just for them if they, if they want it. Uh, or what's, what, you, what that is usually used for is to turn on a new, uh, a new feature just for kind of Hootsuite internal people so that we can kind of uh, dog food it internally. Or is that called cat fooding? Maybe it's cat fooding if it's only engineering, dog fooding if it's everyone else. I don't know. Uh, a specific user ID list, a uh, backend host name for uh, dark launching uh, configuration changes, or just you, the developer. So if you're, if you're developing something, you can test it in production before opening it up to everybody uh, by just dark launching it on to, uh, to just you. Looks like this. This is PHP. Uh, I think this is the only PHP in this presentation. I'm sorry. But uh, I think it's important. Uh, so it's basically just it's basically just a uh, an uh, if statement. So what this is is this is kind of later after member service. So we're currently kind of going through uh, and dark launching our social communication service. So it's a social communication unification management service or SCUM, uh, and. Uh, basically, this is the, the dark launch code. So if it's enabled, if, the, if we're going to use scum to publish our, our tweet or whatever, uh, then do all this stuff, which is call the, the SDK and make the RPC call. Otherwise, just do the old thing uh, that, that was done before. Uh, and, and that's it. So that could be dark launched to 1% uh, of the users. It could be dark launched to 100% of users uh, between the hours of 9 and 5 while we're all like, kind of looking at all the stats and making sure that it doesn't you know, uh, break the world. And then turn it off when we go home. Turn it off over the, over the weekend. And gradually, as we, were, we become more and more confident of this, the performance of this extracted service, gradually ramp it up. That was dark launching. This is our, uh, a little bit of a talk about our custom uh, microservices framework. It's Galanaka, of course. Uh, we designed a custom RPC uh, protocol uh, over, over kind of persistent TCP connections. Um, and I can kind of go into that in more detail if someone asks about it in the question period. Um, it has an integrated, it, it integrates with our reporting and status and logging and statistics uh, stack, which is uh, all of these things. And uh, so it's scalable up to tens of thousands of uh, requests per, per cluster, which is, which is normal. But it's also kind of scalable down, which I, I think is important uh, for local virtualized environments. So if you're working on a service, and that service depends on another service, you might want to run more than, you might want to run half a dozen services on your local, on your laptop, uh, in, you know, your vagrant environments, uh, like a virtualized environment. And so it's scale, this uh, uh, microservices architecture is scalable down to, uh, in, in that way as well, which we think is really important. Looks like this. The clouds are actually the same person. Uh, it's, it's, not very, it's not very clear. It's a request response, but it's also streaming. So we have a, a puller that kind of pulls off the, off the stream. We have a foreman that distributes the, the work, all of these requests, to a scalable number of, uh, of workers. And then they generate a response, and the pusher pushes the response back onto the same, onto the same stream. So it's just a bi-directional, just a kind of bi-directional TCP. All of these are ACA actors. So all of these can be uh, scaled and controlled just the way that you would, uh, you would control another, uh, another, any other sort of actor. Then uh, in a cluster, the, so the green, the green boxes are what the previous slide uh, was. So in a cluster, you could have N of these, uh, N of these nodes. They're all behind uh, a broker. And uh, or a redundant broker, and then behind that or uh, or above that is is your uh, client accessing all of this. Looks like this. This is the implementation of an endpoint. Um, this is this is going to be code. I'm going to go through it really quickly, so don't freak out uh, uh, because it's well, uh, 
But the, the, the cool thing here is that we have modeled HTTP within our protocol. Uh, uh, in fact, this protocol is basically like wrapped HTTP to the point that when we went to write an HTTP proxy for our uh, for our protocol, it was extremely dumb. We just translated some uh, some headers and then we had HTTP uh, for connections. Um, why didn't we use HTTP to begin with? Uh, we didn't want to pay the uh, we, d we thought we didn't want to pay the overhead of uh, establishing a new HTTP connection. So we wanted a, a streaming solution. So this is an implementation of an endpoint. Uh, this is a post of a, uh, of a new photo to, a, uh, uh, to our, our, photo hosting, um, our photo hosting database. So it's kind of like play. It kind of is reminiscent of, of play. Uh, and the cool thing here is uh, that it is kind of embedded with our, uh, with our kind of stats D timing stuff. And it takes in, uh, uh, it's, it's generated with um, macros and it uh, is based on, on futures. Here's a future successful, but you could just as easily return a, uh, a future of wh whatever you're doing. Whatever you're, so whatever your, uh, the thing that you're doing in your endpoint, it doesn't matter, it just, it just becomes a for comprehension uh, that returns a try, and then with the try, you just kind of match on a success or failure and, ret and uh, kind of model that into the, uh, in this case, an HTTP 200, or handle the, handle the error. Again, the logging framework is, re is uh, built right in. So, how did we, at 4,000 requests a second with zero downtime, how did we roll, uh, roll this out from, from our monolith? Uh, it was iterative and it was gradual. And it was, uh, I think, five or six stages, I can't remember. Uh, let's say five. So stage zero, the, uh, you know, write the, write the new old code and do all that stuff with the uh, writing the SDK and, and the API and that kind of refactoring. Stage one, uh, go into a replication phase. So in this case, remember, remember one of the requirements was to do a, uh, a subset of the table. So a subset of the, of the information contained in that fat, fat table was going to come and become part of the new service. Well, we use for a replication, we use this really cool and kind of opaque tool called uh, Tungsten, which is kind of scripted replication. It worked really well for us after we got around the, uh, the problems uh, to, in order to kind of take that table subset and do replication on it into the database backing the new service. So there, the, service is, the service on the old monolith is running uh, in parallel right now. Um, Parallel reads and updates. So we do, uh, for, so for reads of our user records and updates of our user records, we'll uh, kind of do them in the service and in the monolith uh, in parallel and compare the results for, uh, for differential, uh, differential testing. Then we start doing creates in the service with a fallback to the monolith if the creates, uh, the creates fail. I should also mention that all of this, uh, all of these stages, except the last one, which I'll get to, are you can kind of, you can travel between these stages. So maybe you know maybe on a Tuesday you'll get to stage uh, stage three using dark launching, you'll get to stage three, uh, and then and you'll find some problems, and then you'll pull right back. And this is all in production. You'll get to stage three, and then you'll pull it all the way back down to, to stage one, or back to stage zero. You'll blow away the, the problem with the replication. You'll blow away the service database, start up the, the replication again, you know, copy over what, what's appropriate, and, and go from there. You can go and travel in between these, these different stages. Stage four, uh, complete, uh, 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 kind of dedicated to the new service. This is when we had some like, really big confidence but we could still fall back to the PHP. So if there was an error in the, if there was an error in the Scala service, we could still fall back to the PHP. And then stage five, burn it all down. This is my favorite stage. This is where we completely committed to the service and we deleted, for the first time, PHP code uh, in, in the monolith. And it got, uh, it got a tiny bit smaller. And that's how, that's how we kind of gradually went, it went to the, uh, server, the service. So here's just a little diagram about uh, just kind of with our, our replication strategy. So from the big, uh, the, big, the big service to the, or sorry, the big database to the kind of the little table subset that was gonna be controlled by a member service, we did uh, a replication using Tungsten. So again, we went from this to this. 
kind of got a little smaller. A tiny bit smaller, and that's progress. So why did, why did this work? Why did we succeed in doing this? This has been up for, um, we, we completely committed with that, that stage five. Uh, we reached stage five, I think, last summer, like, uh, so say it was uh, uh, July or something, and we have been completely dedicated to this service. It has sat there and hummed with zero downtime for, uh, for eight months. And uh, we even survived the, or the only time that these, ser these services were even restarted, or the, like the, the Java processes were even restarted, was during the Amazon like reboot apocalypse when they had that insane, uh, uh, does anyone remember that? The, the security problem where they had to reboot the entire universe? We survived that with, uh, with zero downtime too by kind of strategically moving things over to, things, to instances that weren't going to be rebooted um, and then fiddling with the, the brokers and stuff. So that was the only time that this has been, uh, the, that we had any sort, of, like, any sort of hiccup and it wasn't even a hiccup. Um, and so why, did, why was this a resounding success? Well, dark launching, again, iteration, uh, always in production, always measuring our successes, measuring how, things, uh, how fast things are, are going, how, what the response time is, and then of course, Scala and ACA. I don't want, I don't want to harp on too much because they're all converts already. But you know, extremely easy to develop, extremely easy to, t uh, to test, and extremely fast uh, in, in production. So I wanted to, uh, I, I, gave this, I gave this talk and I, I practiced this talk and, and my colleagues were like, well, that, we don't want to just talk about things that, that worked. So let's talk about awesome stuff that actually failed uh, dramatically. So, hey, why when we start up our service, do we, the first, uh, you know, 100 or so requests, why are they, you know, 600 milliseconds? Our target was like three milliseconds on average requests. Um, for for reads, uh, and uh, you know up to up to ten or so in the like maybe the the upper 99s. Why, when we start up our service, why is are we getting like 600 milliseconds? Well, the JVM was cold. We figured out how to use tiered compilation, which allows kind of uh, allows a cold JVM to have like low latency responses uh, before it kind of uh, does the the optimization. So it's still a little slow, but it wasn't as slow as as uh, the horrific. Uh, 600 milliseconds. When your service is failing and you're logging a message uh, about that service failure and you want to log some information, don't call the service itself to get the information that you want to log. This is a production outage. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was an infinite loop. Production outage, production outage lasted uh, like 90 seconds. Dark launching. Uh, so instead of uh, so instead of like a, a brand new or instead of like a redeploy that you know 15 minutes or or more or worse it was like it was 90 seconds or something we noticed everything was down oh my god hit the dark launch code everything was back to normal uh, went back to the PHP this of course was when we were in one of those early stages so uh, at like stage three or something so we hadn't fully committed we learned this lesson and and uh, and so uh, that's uh, it won't happen again probably. Uh, we uh, kind of learned the hard way that we needed a circuit breaker. So instead of a human being tripping the, uh, the dark launch code and, and, and turning it off, let's let a machine do that. Let's let a machine look at historical failures uh, of, of the service and trip the, the dark launch code itself. We also learned the hard way that we needed a connection pool for our so-called persistent uh, TCP uh, connections. Uh, we learned that uh, uh, we suffered from the fact that PHP, when servicing a request, tears down the entire universe uh, at the end of that request, including any, uh, any open TCP connections. So if you want your, t your RPC connections to be persistent, we need to implement a kind of a demonized uh, connection pool on each, uh, on each node to get the performance that we uh, desired. So those big, big three things, uh, uh, again, uh, so legacy code is, is fossilized technical debt. You can iterate and learn in, and always do it in production. And you can uh, modernize into Scala. And there are some patterns to do so. Okay, so that was uh, that was a service extraction from the monolith of member service. And this is the modernization of Auli. What is Auli? It's our URL shortening. Service? Who needs a URL shortener in 2015? Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, bear with me. 
the uh, for Hootsuite, you're posting uh, posting links and, and images, and uh, Hootsuite through this Alley service provides uh, uh, not only image hosting and, and URL shortening, but we provide uh, a lot of kind of URL and image click analytics too that you might need. So if you're if you're a brand, you want to see who's clicking your link and why and how and what that reaches. And so we provide analytics. Uh, social analytics for your the links posted to your uh, social networks through Hootsuite. That's my little justification of the existence of a URL shortener in 2015. Uh, so uh, Ali had a has Ali has a public website and uh, an API. We've got a private API used by the the dashboard product to shorten uh, links within the dashboard. Um, like I said, uh, click analytics. And the, the stats are about 10 images uploaded per second, uh, hosted in S3 uh, by us for you for free, um, and about 4,000 redirects per second um, uh, coming in. So these are like the 301 redirects when your short URLs come in, and this is uh, like and, and creating the click analytics. This is what it looked like before we got to it, and. Uh, it was truly fossilized uh, legacy code. So uh, Snowflake deployment, we literally had to like call the guy who knew how to deploy it uh, to, to deploy it to the, uh, to the cluster. And you know, hey, Joe, make that tar file or whatever he did <laughs> to, to deploy it. Uh, it was no, no test coverage at all. It was an old version of PHP. There were security holes in it that we couldn't, uh, that we couldn't address. Uh, the business was requesting changes. So we were getting huge, huge traffic to these image landing pages, right? Uh, uh, traffic that could be monetized. The business was like, hey, can we monetize some of this traffic to, uh, to these landing pages and all that? And we're like, no, <laughs> no, it's too, it's too scary. It's too bad. It was total paralysis. It looked like this. Another monolith. So this is again. This represents the uh, uh, the PHP uh, code, and then we had the dashboard, uh, web browsers, and and mobile. I typed in smartphone to Google Image Search, and it gave me this. I, I don't know. That's uh, I think that's a smartphone. So what do we do? We rewrote the front end uh, as a play framework uh, application. We created a back end data service using our, our, our microservice, uh, our uh, custom framework. It was a cross team effort. We pulled, in, uh, we pulled in members from other teams into this highly focused effort to do this modernization. And we did it with zero, plan zero planned downtime and very few bugs. Th again, this is a kind of a drop in, a drop in replacement as opposed to a gradual, uh, a gradual kind of uh, changeover. And we did it with no huge scoping failures. When you're staring at 100,000 lines of, uh, of legacy code and, you're, and someone asks you, well, how long is this going to take to, to modernize? That's a, that's a really tough question. Like, how long? Well, how many minutes per line of PHP, how many dollars is that going to take to modernize and make it uh, not crappy? And we, we did it. I'm going to tell you how. We did it with no huge uh, scoping failures, uh, you know, plus or minus many months. So how do we modernize it? Clear scoping, as w which uh, I'll, I'll get to. We did a full team, uh, full team development. We had highly parallel development, everyone attacking this at the same time, and then a smaller team to kind of monitor and gradually get to 100% in production. Uh, we used, uh, from the very beginning, we used development best practices to ensure that the to ensure that the legacy problem, the technical debt problem we were cr we were creating was was minimized. So of course, unit test coverage. We had integration tests. Uh, we had multiple environments: uh, our local virtualized environments, development, kind of global development environment, staging uh, environment in the cloud, and then of course production. And then uh, all from the very beginning, proper monitoring, logging, and alerting. And we had the philosophy of going to production with the minimalist viable pr uh, viable product. So as soon as you have one endpoint done, into production. We could dark launch the private API. So uh, within, the, within the, uh, the monolith, the dashboard monolith, we could dark launch what APIs we were using to the new Alley versus the old Alley. And so as soon as we had created one endpoint, we, we dark launched it on. Dark launch is awesome. 
So scope analysis, or how we didn't under underestimate or overestimate the work, the work by six months or n millions of dollars. Here's how we did it. We started with the user story, so the private API endpoints, the public API endpoints, the screens in the system, the, uh, the AJAC endpoints uh, uh, supporting those screens, and then of course the 301 redirects and the analytics. Then we started thinking about the deprecated API versions that were very clearly unused, that dated back the, you know, six years into the past that no one was, uh, no one was using. We started thinking about the deprecated screens, the screens that we didn't want to bring into the new system uh, and, uh, and, and recreate in the new system. Like just kind of features that were explicitly deprecated. And then deprecated cross-cutting uh, cross features. So these could be um, things like alternative me methods of, of logging in or weird logging, uh, like kind of weird logging or statistics uh, uh, generation. So these could, be, uh, these could be kind of user visible features or kind of technological features. So we just enumerated them. We started thinking about them. And uh, deprecated technology. So, the, uh, so kind of logging and uh, different, different ways that PHP does things and, and different things that it supports uh, that was not going to be present in the new system. Scope analysis only took a couple of weeks. Everybody got into a room, well not into a room, but everybody started looking at, uh, at all of these different problems, all of these different kind of enumerations of what needed to be done. And then the product owner, and the product owner signed off on the deprecated features and API versions, and the architect signed off on the deprecated technologies and, uh, and kind of uh, cross-cutting features. So we got the appropriate, the appropriate sign-off right from the very beginning, and we thought about it, we thought about it really hard and, uh, and wrote it down. And then we didn't write any spe specifications. So when modernizing, your first thought is to do, it's like, okay, we've got, to, uh, we've got to figure out, we've got to write user stories and we've got to write specifications and, and kind of write down using language or whatever what the old system does and then we've got to re-implement that in the, in the new system. We've got to like have, you know, a, 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 fat, a fat binder full of, uh, full of kind of specifications and then we're gonna like write all the code. No, no specifications. And I'm gonna tell you why. So the development scope, so when we started development, the development scope is the sum of all of the things, uh, all of the kind of the cross-cutting things that we, had, uh, that we had enumerated and that we had explicitly removed. So again, start with a story, now as a developer. Then we look at the PHP itself. Open up uh, PHP Storm and look at the PHP. We're all smart, we can all do it, PHP is easy to read, look at it, see what it does. Don't try to do any other intermediate step to determine the scope of, uh, of what you're writing for your, your modern system from the old system. Keep in mind the cross-cutting scope alterations. If you come across a piece of functionality that's very explicitly out of scope because you, you listed it at the beginning, well, don't do it. And, but while keeping that in mind, err on the side of, of leave it in and leave it broken. Why? Because for leave it in, it's much easier to determine whether or not uh, a section of code is dead or not in the modern system, rather than kind of trying to look and trying to trace the, the paths in the PHP, just leave it in, bring it over to the Scala. It's probably just some like, uh, like old validation. It's easier to type it in as Scala, even to test it as Scala, than to kind of not leave it in while you're looking at that code as the PHP, or looking at the PHP and deciding what to what to do. Leave it broken. Obvious bugs in the, in the PHP affecting the behavior of the old system, you gotta leave that in. People are using these APIs and using the broken APIs and expecting those broken features and if you fix it and make it right, those clients are going to, uh, are going to suffer and it will not be a successful modernization. It won't be a successful drop-in replacement for the old system. And that was the goal. The goal was to have a drop-in replacement for the time being, or for, for a small amount of time, running in parallel, doing the exact same thing, servicing the same, uh, servicing the same endpoints. 
and then clear modularization in the, in the new system. So, okay, let's look at some Scala. Kind of getting, uh, getting late here, sorry. So uh, this is something that we're proud of in, in, in Scala, and this is uh, kind of an example of component, uh, componentization. This is a cake pattern component of something called a, uh, the URL gatekeeper, and the guts are here. Uh, the, implement the URL gatekeeper is a, uh, just the thing that kind of checks the dark lists, or check, checks the black lists of, uh, of whatever you're doing. And, um, or, or, sorry, of URLs that you are trying to shorten or trying to, trying to redirect. Um, and what this kind of cake pattern componentization allows us to do is mock this component, creating true unit tests. So in a unit test for an endpoint, for example, uh, if you don't need to go off to the Google Safe Browsing API or you don't need to check your internal uh, manual uh, blacklists or, or whitelists, you shouldn't be doing that anyways because it's a unit test. Well, you can mock it like this. Uh, and that's, that, that's what we did throughout the, the, all of the components uh, of the new system. So then now, here in our, uh, our Scala test, this is kind of standard play framework Scala test, uh, testing a controller, everything, all of the components that are not under test are mocked, including our URL gatekeeper. So the only non-mocked one is the, is the controller, the play framework controller that is, uh, that is under test right there. And then you just test it normally. So uh, this is an expand URL uh, uh, request that, uh, that we're, te we're testing the, the endpoint and the validation. And it's a, it's a standard play framework test. But we don't have to worry about whether or not the, uh, the Google Safe Browsing API is down or not, uh, nor should we, because it's a, uh, it's a unit test. We also had integration tests that would go out to Google and ask for uh, uh, URL blocking. What do we do on the UI in Play Framework? We were a bunch of, we were a bunch of kind of like low-level platform guys. We were like, ugh, UI, HTML, that's weird. Uh, well, we stole some uh, UX developers from another team. We gave them zero training. Uh, we told them how to run SBT and how to like spin up the, spin up the application. They're like, uh, oh, you know, how do, I, how do I open the Vagrant box? And we're like, no, don't bother. Just, just run it natively and, and, you know, uh, and it'll refresh. And uh, they were amazed by that. Uh, and they kind of put in their already existing uh, Grunt uh, asset pipeline um, for uh, the uh, uh, CDN publishing and all that other weird stuff. I think like less files become CSS. Or, anyways, front end stuff, it's all, I don't get it. But anyway, they, it, does, it does all that. Um, and then here's a quote from, uh, from my friend Steve, who we stole and, and made to work on our, our project. And he, he loved it. He, he, was, uh, he was really great. It turned into this. Uh, so this is kind of like the updated UI. Again, the, like the UI wasn't the, uh, the, the major component to Alley. It's the, the API was the, the, the primary use of it. But uh, I, like to so I like to show this because it's, it's, it's visual. And it, repre it represents how we could change it, how, how we could kind of uh, change, uh, change, the, change the UI and change the behavior now that it had been uh, modernized. So a little anecdote. Uh, anyone heard of Gearman? Really? Awesome. <laughs> so Gearman is a, uh, a way, a kind of, Gearman is, is uh, PHP's uh, answer to, oh, uh, I don't know, like uh, remote, remote actors, kind of remote, uh, remote job uh, actors. It's kind of demonized, demonized PHP processes looking, uh, looking for kind of a flow of jobs and then executing those jobs and it can horizontally scale um, on, on nodes. And we had to integrate with, uh, with our uh, Gearman cluster for these, uh, for these click analytics. And we did this uh, by, well, first finding a really cool Java uh, library that actually did it for us, but it was blocking. Uh, well, that, that's fine. Um, we wrapped it in an actor, uh, as you do. And, and wrapping it in an actor allowed us to choose the, uh, the integration semantics of, this, uh, of accessing this legacy component, this legacy Gearman component. Um, so uh, we could choose fire and forget. We could cho choose reliable RPC. We could choose a strategy that where if this other service goes down, uh, we don't go down, like bulkheading. We could choose different bulkheading strategies like load shedding or, uh, or buffering. 
We ended up with uh, fire and forget, but we could very easily just swap in anything else uh, because of ACA. And because of ACA using, uh, ACA being able to very gracefully integrate this kind of legacy acting library. So <clears throat> this is play, this should be even more familiar to you. This is just an example of, uh, of kind of our, our what, how we augmented play with our framework to kind of handle things that were in the PHP uh, in a more elegant way. So, what, uh, so here we have our, uh, our kind of our timed measurement. So we, we time the future being requested here and send that off to StatsD for a timer. Uh, we do a logger and we do a StatsD increment for this, uh, for this request, or the, sorry, the successful request right here. Um, here, we, uh, here we have some common code to uh, handle PHP weirdness in uh, URL parameters. And uh, most importantly, a, uh, like a loan pattern for the uh, authenticated API members. So if you're using the API, the public API, you need to be authenticated. And this one line allows us to kind of swap in or, or handle what hundreds and hundreds of lines of cut, copy, PHP did beginning of every single, uh, every single endpoint in the PHP. You have to check to see if the, if the API person has, uh, has access. So uh, yeah, so that saved hundreds of lines of PHP. Um, and then of course, it's just at the, in the, in the guts, it's just a, a for comprehension that returns a, uh, th that returns a, uh, a future. And here we have our, where is it? Is URL blocked? We pass in our, uh, our URL gatekeeper, not mocked in production, of course, and, uh, and then proceed. This, you might not be able to read that, but this is just a kind of a standard error handling. We're, we're, we're uh, translating lower level errors into our HTTP response codes. Can anyone spot the bug here? There's a hint. So this is us leaving a bug in uh, so that uh, we can have a, uh, so that we can provide the same functionality uh, of, the, uh, of the legacy system. So here it's an invalid data exception, but we turn return 404 not found instead of, hey, th you're giving me an invalid data. Had to leave it in. But you know what? Now that it's a modernized, uh, a modernized system, Now that it's a modernized system, we can, actually, uh, we can actually fix these bugs now that it's completely dropped in. So how did this, how was this uh, made successful? Well, dark launching, of course, iteration, of course, measure everything, everything and, of, and the play framework itself. Uh, we all know that the play framework is amazing and uh, extremely easy to use, and uh, we found that in practice. Everyone, uh, everyone's on board. So again, uh, here's the old monolith in the, in the, for uh, PHP, and we made it into this. So we, on the front end, we have a play framework uh, a cluster of nine nodes and a back end cluster of, uh, of nine nodes. Reduce the amount of money that we were paying to Amazon by something like $25,000 a, a year or some, some very high uh, amount. So exciting failures. Do I have enough time for this? Okay, I'll go, I'll go really quickly. So PHP serialization I won't talk about, but the, uh, uh, finally, uh, Single-threaded DDoS bots. At 11 o'clock one morning, uh, our friend, uh, my, uh, my friend from security uh, runs over uh, to me and is like, oh my God, the current DDoS that is, uh, that is being under, uh, that is, uh, is happening with Auli uh, just jumped, bu jumped up by 1,000%. We're getting 1,000% requ more requests uh, uh, coming, uh, coming through. And uh, uh, what's, what's going on? I was like, oh, 11 o'clock? Yeah, that's when we've switched the load balancers over to the new system. The new system was 1,000% faster at servicing requests. And so the single-threaded processes out on the internet that were currently uh, DDoSing us uh, were, uh, were able to just go faster. And we were able to absorb all that traffic. It was, it, it was not a user-facing uh, user problem uh, at all. It was an unsuccessful DDoS. I thought it would have been hilarious had it like peaked up at like you know whatever like thousands of requests a second and then dropped off, meaning that the our very ability to service all of that load crashed the uh, <laughs> crashed the clients out, of, out in the internet. Now it didn't happen; it just kept on going until we blacklisted the IPs. So finally, uh, the three things: tell them what you told them, 
uh, legacy code is fossilized technical debt, but you can address it. You can crawl out of that hole. You have to iterate in production to do it, and you can do it with Scala. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? I'll take questions until they kick me out. Uh, the question was, uh, how do the uh, TCP streaming work uh, between the, the, the client and the, and the back-end worker specifically? Zero MQ. We use zero MQ uh, to maintain a reliable TCP. Uh, we use zero MQ to, to maintain a reliable TCP connection. Uh, it implements reliable, uh, uh, one of the things it implements is reliable message passing and reconnection and all sorts of like really fancy stuff. The only thing that we had to do to, it was to kind of write a connection pool using zero MQ, the, the various kind of zero MQ components uh, to kind of maintain those connections. And that worked really well. Uh, the question was, did we use any open source solutions or did we do, uh, basically do everything in-house? So uh, we used a ton of open source solutions. We would not have been able to do any of this without uh, uh, the uh, appropriately licensed uh, open source uh, uh, solutions, which were, uh, which were amazing. Um, we did decide to create our, the, the microservices framework uh, itself uh, uh, from scratch using, you know, using ZeroMQ, which is open source, and uh, many other kind of uh, components. The reason why we did that is because uh, things like Finangle were, uh, didn't exist or were scary, um, you know, the Twitter, Twitter Scala ecosystem. Um, and we wanted, control over, we wanted control over it. We wanted to kind of very tightly address, be able to address kind of, uh, you know, security and performance issues. And everything else didn't support uh, PHP. So we needed, uh, we needed PHP, first order PHP support and, uh, and Scala support. Final question. So the question was, why did we stick with MySQL uh, even uh, within our, our microservice? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we, did consider, uh, we did consider other kind of backend storage systems, but at the end of the day, ops, we, we knew our MySQL practice uh, could handle that load because it was already already doing so. Ops knew how to was really good at MySQL and uh, could uh, you know could uh, kind of maintain it. Uh, the kind of the tungsten replication, like the replication that we wanted to do to make it to, to make it live, was much. E we could have done it. We could have gone to like anything. We could have gone to Postgres or whatever. But it was easier with MySQL on on both sides, and it wasn't necessary to, uh, we didn't feel it was necessary to really take that plunge as well, considering we were writing a new, uh, we were writing a service. So if we ever wanted to switch to another type of storage backend, well, we would just write an, a new service that, that, uh, that has the same interface, uh, you know, try to mirror the data in some, in some intelligent way that maybe that we create or whatever, and then when the time comes, swap in the new service. Becoming a data service made the, uh, made the kind of future kind of architectural uh, adjustments Easy, probably, as he has to be seen. Uh, thank you very much, that was the last question. Thank you very much. <laughs>